Yeah. Happy Church Day. Always great to be together. I want to say a quick uh, extra congratulations to everybody who graduated. Uh, yes, we. I, I hope you feel encouraged. I hope you feel loved. We are so proud of you and all the hard work that you guys have put into the last years, a few years of your life and things like that. And uh, we're just really excited for you. I hope you're excited for all the incredible things God's going to do. Um, you know, this idea of graduation that we talked about this morning plays a little bit of a role into what I want to talk about today, and we'll get into that here in a bit. Um, but before we get into kind of the Bible, I did want to share with you a little bit about my life that I don't think I've had a chance to share with the church yet. And it, it kind of goes back to when I graduated high school. Uh, this is me uh, when I, uh, this was my senior year of high school. Much longer hair, yep. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was homecoming king. Uh, it wasn't a very big school, so not a huge deal. Um, but, uh, but, but I grew up in a family that was uh, quite religious, had a strong faith in God. It didn't necessarily affect my life, but it was there. I had a solid group of friends. A lot of people liked me enough to vote me homecoming king. Uh, you know, I had good grades, and, uh, you know, to, to a lot of people, my life kind of looked like, man, this is, this is, he's got things going right. That's about as good as it gets. And it was funny, and I think a lot of people experience, you read stories about it on the news all the time, but although on the outside life looked really great, there was a big part of me that was always looking for more, right? I never had enough. You know, no matter if it was homecoming king, all the friends, the girlfriend, straight A's, like no matter what it was, it was never even close to enough. You know, I tried to fill a lot of the, what I was looking for in my life, this emptiness, I, I tried to fill it with drugs at, at, at different points in my life. I smoked a lot of weed when I was in high school. I ended up getting addicted to methadone by the age of 15, almost died in the passenger seat of my friend's car because of it. Um, I, I, I tried to fill it with impurity and girlfriends and pornography and, and, and anything that would kind of bring me a little bit of life, even just for a moment. That everything on the outside looked great, but for some reason I sought these dangerous things in my life to try to give me more. I kept asking myself, is this as good as it gets? Is this all? You know, even as a disciple, as a follower of Jesus, there's been times in my life where I've kind of been in a similar place. Feeling like, is this as good as it gets? Is this what Jesus meant when he said life to the full? Now, it doesn't consist of me going back to drugs or women or things like that, but it does consist of me running to media. It consists of me running to my own pride, thinking that if I think highly enough about myself that I'll feel better. It consists of me running towards laziness and trying to kind of get that instant gratification. You know, there's times, even as a follower of Jesus, I feel like there's an emptiness that needs to be filled. And to be honest, I don't think I'm the only one. Amen. Amen. I don't think I'm the only one that feels like there has to be more to my life at times. And so today we're going to take a look at what Jesus says it takes to have life to the full. Amen? What Jesus says it takes to have the life that God intended us to have. The title this morning is Dying to Live. You know, we, we say this a lot, right? We're dying to do something, right? Like, man, I'm dying to see that new Avengers movie. You know, the new Spider-Man movie. Man, I'm, man, I'm dying for some rest right now. You know, man, I am dying to talk to that girl, you know, what's up, Alana? <laughs> you know, sometimes we say that all the time where we're, 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 you know, we're dying to do something, right? And like 99.9% .9 of the time, we're not really dying to do anything, you know what I'm saying? It's just, but Jesus does talk about how in order to live, it has to be something we are actually dying to do. If you guys have a Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 21. A little context here, Jesus has just been recognized by Peter as the Messiah, right? Peter has had this incredible moment where he's, he's, he said, Jesus, I believe you are the Christ. And Jesus is like, you got it, man. You nailed it. You finally did something right. Way to go. And so Peter's on this high. He feels great about himself. He got, he got the answer correct. And we pick up here in verse 21. And it says... From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, 
get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory and his, with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So, this is directly following Peter's exaltation for recognizing that Jesus is the Christ. Big deal. And we start off here with Jesus explaining to his 12 closest disciples, the apostles, that he is going to have to suffer many things and ultimately be killed at the hands of the religious leaders of the day. And you can imagine, after just recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah, hearing something like this would have come as a huge shock. Like, wait a minute, you're the Christ, and now you're saying you're going to be killed by people, right? In the minds of people back then, the Messiah was going to be the one doing the kind of the, maybe not necessarily killing, but overtaking the people who were overtaking them. He was going to be the winner. He was going to be the one that would conquer all the people that had conquered them. This would have been a shock. And so Peter, being Peter, attempts to rebuke the man that he just called God's anointed one. And he explains, there's no way the Messiah could ever die. In order for him to fulfill what he has to do, the Messiah has to live. He has to be alive. And so Jesus helps Peter understand that in order to have the purpose and fulfillment that Jesus was meant to have, he had to die. And Jesus makes it clear as he's talking to the disciples here that the same thing goes for us. My first point this morning is we die. I figured I would start things off really encouraging, (laughs) really uplifting, make you feel welcome like you want to come back next Sunday. But unfortunately, Jesus does talk a lot about us dying. You know, we dive into the scripture, and it's one that a lot of us in here may be familiar with. If you look through the Bible at the different times that Jesus talks about what it means to follow him, the words that he says here are said over and over and over again. If you've studied out what it really means to be a Christian, a disciple according to the Bible, you've probably looked at a passage just like this. And I think what happens is when we read the scripture, we lose focus on the connection between Jesus calling us to follow him and Jesus on his way to die. Like, where are we following him to? You know, for the longest time, I read this scripture, and to me, it just meant Jesus has to call the shots. I got to live a life where Jesus is the one that makes the decisions for me. And I focus so much on how I'm supposed to live and not at all on how I'm supposed to die. How I'm supposed to take hold of my life instead of how I'm supposed to let it go. So what does Jesus say it looks like to follow him as he prepares to die for all of us. Well, let's get into that a little bit. The first thing he starts off is saying, he says that anybody who wants to be my disciple has to deny themselves. And this idea of denying yourself is not something that we use kind of all the time. We're hanging out like Jared and I want to get a pizza. Jared, you got to deny yourself, bro. I want pepperoni. Can we please do that? Can you deny yourself? You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? We don't, we don't use it that often. But the word that Jesus uses here when he says, to deny yourself, the most popular place that we actually see it is just a few chapters later in Matthew 26 when somebody denies Jesus three times. Peter, in the courtyard, denies Jesus three times before the rooster crows. You see, when Peter denies Jesus, he doesn't deny doing something that Jesus wanted him to do. When Peter denies Jesus, he denies any knowledge or connection with him. You see, denying Jesus wasn't saying no to Jesus for Peter. Denying Jesus was saying, I have no idea who that person is. When Jesus says that we have to deny ourselves, he's not telling us to necessarily just say no to the things that you want at times. He's not saying to kind of push away your needs for the needs of God. He's saying that when we deny ourselves, we act like we have no idea who we are anymore. We live as though I don't know who Josh is, and so nothing that I do revolves around Josh. I don't know that person. When I decided to follow Jesus, Josh was gone. 
I deny knowing him. To deny ourselves is to act like we no longer exist. You know, I think something that falls into this idea of self-denial is, is this. You know, as we become followers of Jesus, there's things that we bring in to the kingdom that we are just naturally good at. Things that we are just naturally capable of doing that, 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 that just come easy to us. And they happen to also fall in line with different things that Jesus calls us to do. Amen? Amen. Parts of being a disciple that we're just kind of naturally gifted with. You know, for me, I love just connecting and making people feel important. That's just something that even if I wasn't a follower of Jesus, I probably would do a lot because it comes naturally, and I, I enjoy doing it. But is it really denying ourselves when we only do the things that we're naturally good at? Is it really denying ourselves when we excel at the things that we're just naturally good at, but we do not strive to do the things that maybe are difficult for us or don't come naturally? You know, if we choose to deny ourselves, if we choose to go after the things that are not necessarily of us, and that is acting like we no longer know who we are. But we're following Jesus and we're doing them because Jesus did them as well. But Jesus doesn't just stop here. He then tells them that they have to take up their crosses. You know, back then, most of you may know this, but back then a cross was not something that was just set aside for Jesus. You know, people died on crosses every single day in the Roman Empire. If you grew up anywhere near the Roman Empire, chances are even as a kid you would have walked by somebody who had been crucified. They used them to scare people straight, to make sure nobody rebelled against the Roman Empire. A cross was a very common thing during this time. It was a popular and effective form of execution. And the disciples wouldn't have taken this to mean, oh, I have to carry my burdens Right? Oh, I have to kind of take up my sins for Jesus because Jesus hadn't died on the cross yet. There's no connection between the cross and Jesus except for the fact that he's calling them to take up theirs. When the disciples heard this, the only thing they would have understood about it is that you have to die. If you're going to be my disciple, death is going to be a part of your walk with me. Taking up your cross following me, death is going to be a large part of the way that we live. And then finally, after he calls them to deny themselves, to take up their cross, he calls them to follow him. And I think the only place that the disciples can even imagine Jesus going right now is to the hands of the religious leaders to die. That as he calls them to follow him, they're imagining if we follow you, we're going to die as well. I think Jesus wanted one thing to be clear to his disciples here. Because they obviously didn't grasp it when he talked about it a few chapters earlier in Matthew 10. He says almost the exact same thing. And yet Peter's still rebuking him for talking about this idea of death. If, I think he wanted one thing to become clear, and that's that in order to have anything to do with Jesus, in order to have anything to do with the life that God had planned for them, they were going to have to die. They had to lose their lives. And the crazy thing, this might sound harsh, this might sound like, man, this is a hard chapter to read. I really enjoy the rest of the Bible a lot more. Well, the rest of the Bible talks about it as well. You know, here's just a few passages that are really helpful in helping us understand this idea of death in our walks with God. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Galatians 6.14, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Romans 6, 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Romans 12, 1, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. Colossians 3.3, 3, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Finally, 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. The same thing goes for us today. The same thing goes for each and every one of us that are in here today that say we want to follow Jesus. 
that we have to die if we truly want to live the way that God intended us to. Ask yourself this morning, have you been living your life as though you were dead? As though Shashank Mishra died and was done away with years ago. As though the Collins died and were done away with. When they said they wanted to follow Jesus, they disappeared. As though, as though Tyler's son, when he got baptized, he was no longer around anymore, but instead it was Jesus. Are we living our lives as though we're no longer there? Are we trying to squeeze out as much out of this life as we can in order to grab onto the fullness that we want so bad? What would your life look like tomorrow if you woke up thinking that you were dead and done away with and that your ambitions and your wants and your life passed away with you and you were simply a vessel for Jesus? What would it look like? What would change? What would be different in your day-to-day actions? You know, how, what about your money and your finances? I appreciate everything that Jared shared. You know, if, if, if we woke up tomorrow as though we no longer existed, would we continue to go out there and buy the clothes and the new electronics and the plasma 4D TV and whatever it is? Or would we be looking for opportunities to give to the church and to our brothers and sisters in need? Think about our evangelism, Right? our opportunities to go out and talk to other people about what God's done in our lives, this incredible family that we have at church. You know, if we woke up tomorrow and thought, man, it's no longer about me, I'm gone, would we let things like our comfort and our reputation and, 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 and our interactions with other people get in the way of us giving people an opportunity to have the same life that Jesus is promising to us? You know, next time somebody asked you to borrow money, they needed a ride somewhere, or they, maybe they needed to have one of those long talks after church, you know what I'm saying? Maybe the next time you needed to have that talk with somebody else, would you be reluctant? Or would you be like, man, I, I died five years ago. Let's do it, man. I'm here for you. You know, I know for me, it's the little things that wouldn't affect me so much. The little things that can just get up under my skin and cause me to just get frustrated and angry and, and go to a place that is just totally not cool. I think about like a stain on my favorite shirt. I wore a white shirt today, and I'm like, you know, every second I'm holding my kid, I'm like, you know. And, you know, but I think about Kai, right? When he's eating dinner like a gremlin, and he's messing up the kitchen. I spent three hours cleaning the night before. You know, misunderstanding with my wife. These kinds of things wouldn't set me off if I lived like I wasn't here anymore. Church, what would our lives look like if we truly lived them as though we were dead and done away with? My next point this morning is we live, right? It's getting a little better. We die, but, but man, Jesus promises that we will live. You know, I think it's clear, this focus on death, right? But the big question is why? Why would anybody in their right mind want to join a group of people that totally forgets about themselves, Right? Why would, why would anybody want to do something like that? Well, Jesus gives us some of the greatest reasons we could ever want. Amen? In verse 25, he says that anyone who wants to save their life will lose it, but anyone who loses their life for him will find it. A lot of times I read this scripture and I think that Jesus is saying, if I give up my life here on earth, I'm going to gain eternal life in heaven. And there's a lot of that in here, right? Jesus totally says that, especially at different times in his ministry. But as we dig into what he's saying here, it's even more. Like, we don't even deserve the whole salvation thing. And Jesus is saying, but it, it, it gets better. Order now and you'll get two slap chops for the price of one. If you don't know what a slap chop is, um, you're not missing out on much. First of all, the word Jesus uses for life is the same word that he uses later in verse 26 when he talks about your soul. And that's the word in the Greek, it's psyche. It's where we get psychology, psychological from. It's, it's our mind. It's all the life that goes on right here, right now. Our emotions, our intentions, our purpose-driven life. It's a very different word than the one that he uses when he talks about eternal life. That's the word zoe. So we know he's not talking about that. And it's a little bit different than the spiritual life. When Jesus talks about the spirit, the pneuma that goes within us and guides kind of our spiritual life, he's talking about the here and now, the emotional kind of life that we're living right here. And it's cool because Jesus doesn't say that by giving up our lives, we will gain this new life, right? That would be one thing that says, hey, if you lose your life here, you're going to gain eternal life. And he does say that at different times. 
But here he says that if we lose our life here, we will find it. We will find it. That there's a life that's been there this whole time, and if you just give up the one you're trying to grab onto, you'll find the one that's been waiting for you. It's a lot like a seed from a tree, right? You take a little seed, like a mustard seed or an acorn or whatever, and, 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 and that doesn't look like much, but when you put it in the ground, and the outside of it decides to die and finally let the seed do its thing, it becomes the life that was hidden inside of it all along. It becomes this incredible, but it has to die first. The outer shell, the part that you see initially has to be done away with so that the rest of it can do its job, so that the life can be found. Same goes for us, right? Jesus calls us to lose our lives and live as though we've died, not so that we have this lifeless, unfulfilling life, which I think is a lot of times how we can view it in the moment. But he calls us to do that so that we can actually have the full and complete life that we were meant to have. You know, I think we go there so much. We go there so often that if we live like all-out disciples, if we just give up everything for Jesus like he calls us to in Luke 14, 33, give up everything, we so often think that our life is going to be boring, it's going to be unrealistic, that our needs are not going to be met. We find it difficult to enjoy being a disciple because part of us is still holding on to our life. There's still things that we hold on to that we're afraid if we let it go, everything that matters is going to go with it. We haven't let go of certain areas in our lives, and therefore we haven't been able to experience the purposeful and fulfilling life we're meant to have here on earth. And here's the thing. I'm not saying that you give up everything. You really go after dying to yourself that you're always going to be happy. I'm not saying that everything is going to start to go right. right? This isn't prosperity gospel. Jesus didn't say that, so I'm not going to say it. But you know what I am saying? Is that when we do that, we will have the life God meant for us to have, which will be more fulfilling and purposeful than any other life we could take hold of. You know, I remember, everybody's sharing their story. I remember when I became a disciple. And uh, I remember how my life finally felt like it had purpose. That little part that I've been looking for, that I've been running to all these crazy different things for, I finally felt like, like, this is it. Like, I finally figured it out. Something that's bigger than me. Something that gives me drive and a purpose and challenges me and calls me to be a better person and actually helps me feel like I've done something incredible at the end of the day instead of just for five minutes. You know, honestly, I think if I hadn't changed my life and died to myself, I probably would have physically died the way that my life was going, seeking for life in all these crazy different places. I want to ask us this morning, what's an area in your life that you have not felt fulfilled in, that you've thought there is no way that this is what Jesus meant when he said, you're going to have life to the full with me? For me, it's it's my discipline. You know, there's times where my discipline embarrasses me. I look at it, I look at the things that take up so much of my time at different points, and I think, man, like that felt good for just a couple of minutes, and I look back, I'm like, that was not fulfilling. I just feel worse than I did before. Spending time watching sports, scrolling on my phone, putting off important work for something immediately gratifying. Staying up later than I should have so that the next day I'm too tired to give to my family and God like I'm supposed to. You know, every single time I choose not to be disciplined, It feels good for a second, but it is never fulfilling later on. I mean it. And that's just that's just discipline. I mean, think think about your marriage. Is your marriage the one that you feel like God promises in the Bible? The marriages that you see maybe different people living around you. Do we spend so much time wanting to please ourselves, wanting to be right in conversations and maybe even disagreements, or are we focused on losing our lives so that we can have an incredible marriage that really is fulfilling and pleasing? To God and to you. This is a touchy one, and I, I don't know why I feel like I'm getting emotional already, but even parents with our children. How could losing your life mean a closer and more significant relationship with your children? How could giving up your life mean greater impact of love and godliness and righteousness on your toddlers? You know, how could denying yourself mean a greater example for your teenagers? I'm not a perfect parent. I'm still learning so much and have so much to learn. But I do know that if we decided to die to ourselves, man, our relationship with our kids would skyrocket. You know, our friendships, just relationships with people in the church, are they like the ones that we see in the Bible or is Facebook as deep as it goes? 
Do you know more about the people sitting next to you because of pictures you see on Instagram, or do you know more about them because you love them and you get in there with them? That only happens when we die to ourselves, amen? And then we have relationships that are all about life. You know, if you're visiting here today, maybe it's your first or second time, and maybe you're not sure if you've ever completely died to yourself. Maybe there's parts of your life and you feel like, man, like, that cannot be what it means to follow Jesus in that way. I want to encourage you, ask whoever invited you out or whoever you're sitting next to, just to, like, study the Bible. Figure out the different things that Jesus says we can do to really go after that kind of lifestyle. What area are you lacking life to the full that you could be having? My last point this morning is we follow. All right, we die, we live, and we follow. Jesus' invitation for us to follow him here and throughout the scriptures, because he does it a lot to a lot of different groups of people, it contains something incredible that we don't initially recognize because we're so separated from the culture of Jesus. But here, I want to help you guys understand a little bit, and this it kind of ties in with graduation a little bit. But, you know, back in Jesus' day, um, Kids grew up from an extremely young age going to school to learn about the scriptures of the Old Testament. They would go there and they would memorize the entire Old Testament. I mean, they would put our memorization to shame, like like little six-year-olds, you know what I mean? And they would spend this time memorizing and learning the scriptures and how to teach them and understand them. And at about 12, those who were kind of the top of the class would go on to learn more and continue their education— And those who maybe weren't quite at the top of the class would go on to take on the uh, careers of their parents. And those who continued in the schooling, who continued to learn more and more and memorize more and more scripture and learn how to teach it and understand it, about the top 1% of them, if they were lucky, would be asked by a rabbi to follow them. He would say, akalatheo in Greek, it means follow me. And you would hear that, and it would be one of the greatest honors of your entire life to make it through all of this school and for a rabbi to come up to you and say, I want you to be the one to carry on my teaching. Just you, maybe a few others, would have been one of the greatest honors that you could receive. It'd be like graduating valedictorian with your PhD from Harvard. Harvard right under UF, you know, so maybe graduating <laughs> UF, PhD, valedictorian. You know, receiving an invitation to follow Jesus is like we have all graduated into the most incredible rabbi school that ever lived. Amen. We have all graduated. We have all been, re- we've received that invitation, that, that, that letter of acceptance, not just to any school, but to Jesus' school. And the the call to follow Jesus, the invitation to follow, we read it so often as a challenge and a test, and can you really do it? But Jesus looks at it as, as something that should be so encouraging and exciting. Do you realize how incredible it is that Jesus invited all of us to follow him? So amazing. And when we follow Jesus... We're given an example that not only proves that all of these things he says about death and life are true, but we're given an example that motivates us us to do it as well. You know, after Jesus lays out the truth of his impending death to Peter and he rebukes him, uh, you know, he, he, he tells Peter to get behind him. He says, get behind me. And the interesting thing about that is he says, Peter, you're trying to lead. I need you to follow. I need you to get in the place where you can follow me so that you can see what I'm saying really works. And as Jesus tells Peter to get behind him, he refers to him as Satan, right? Raise your hand if you've called anybody Satan in the last month. (laughs) Oh, I thought you raised your hand, Chris. We're about to have a talk. (laughs) Um, Not a very common thing to say to somebody, right? Yet Jesus decides to go there with me. Jared, have you called somebody? Okay, I'm just making sure. Um, <laughs> oh, fair enough, fair enough. But Jesus used a very specific thing when he talks to Peter here. And I think the reason is because Peter was acting with Jesus the exact same way Satan had tried to tempt him before. We go back, still the book of Matthew. It's incredible how all of this connects throughout Matthew. I'd encourage you to go back and read it. But back in Matthew chapter 4, verse 8, it says this. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. All the kingdoms of the world and their glory. 
I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. You see, Jesus had been tempted by Satan with everything that this life could offer. Every, it says all the kingdoms in their glory. Can you imagine being on a hill and seeing all the kingdoms before you and being told, I will give this all to you if you just worship me. But he knew that nothing this world could offer would ever even come close to what he would receive if he chose to die. That's why he says, what good is it to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit your very soul? And we go right to the end of Matthew, Matthew, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Jesus has resurrected. He comes to his disciples and he tells them that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. That, you know, hey, Satan, you know all that you try to tempt me with? Well, I got all that. And you know what? I also have all the authority in heaven as well. Because I chose to die rather than trying to live here on earth. Again, the same thing goes for us today. We have the greatest example in the cross of death turning into the greatest life of purpose and fulfillment. But we also have the greatest motivation in the cross as God's grace opens the door for us to experience that life. You know, as we close out here today, I want to give us a practical. You guys okay with practicals? Amen. Good. Sure. Amen. I want to encourage us all to take one area of our lives that you know is not what it could be in God. An area in your life that you know is not what it's meant to be if you're following Jesus and die to yourself in it. Say you no longer exist in that area. All the things you want and all the things you desire are gone. Remove your selfishness. Take out your laziness. Take out the worry and fear, the arrogance, the love for the world that you have in that area and watch God turn things into what you may have been looking for this whole time. What's it going to be? Guys, God wants us to have the most inspiring, purposeful, and full lives imaginable. We just have to decide to die first. Amen.